Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. I'm Samantha and this is Trans IRL. Tonight we're live once again with a fantastic guest and your questions. This is your first time watching Trans IRL is a live show that takes a closer look at some of those who are making a difference in and for the transgender community. It's a chance for them to share their story and answer your respectful questions about their experiences. Keeping things running in the trans IRL control room is our director, Stephen. So how are we looking over there in the chat tonight? We have our regulars uh, here this evening. Um, our audience, wonderful, just, wonderful. just remember, you have a choice in what you watch today. I mean, obviously, you could have watched the Republican National Convention tonight, or uh, that would have been good, or you could have watched us. So uh, we're very grateful that you watched us tonight. I, I think we know this is the right choice. I think so. Every time. Every time. <laughs> All right. Stephen will be monitoring the live chats as we work through the hour here. So please make sure if you have any questions for our guest, you submit them right there. So with that, let's go ahead and get on with the show. Our guest has long been involved in advocacy for the transgender community, first starting on YouTube 10 years ago, and then through the nonprofit Point of Pride, which he co-founded. He is known for his tireless work as an advocate, public speaker, coach, and now as a father. So tonight we are honored to be joined by Aiden Dowling on the show. Aiden, welcome. Hey, how are you? Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. You know, it was funny, when we, I was putting this show together, I was thinking back to when we first met, which was in Philly last year. And it was such a funny thing because, um, I mean, the entire time, that's just such a, it's such a fast paced event, right? People are milling around between events and everything. And I ran into you like five different times. We talked for a few seconds. We never got a photo together because we were just in and out, in and out, in and out the entire time. But uh, um, what a great experience that was. And you had a whole booth set up there as well. Yeah, Philly is trans island is what I call it. It's like its own little entity and you never want to leave after the weekend's over. Um, and yeah, I know I remember running into you and uh, it's just like, yeah, there's so many people, you make so many connections. And at the same time, it, all of a sudden you're like, wait, I didn't get to hang out with this person and that person and this person. And <laughs> so it's disappointing it's that just it was- not enough time. Busy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but you know, all that, all, all the more to look forward to in 2021 as it kicks off again for its 20th anniversary. I guess that'll now be the 20th anniversary of the uh, Philadelphia Trans Wellness Conference will be next year. Wow, that's gonna be pretty cool. We'll do something oh, yeah. special, I'm sure. All right, so let's go ahead and get right into it. And I wanted to give you the opportunity to, you know, share your story from from your beginnings, a little bit about your experiences growing up, and what your journey of identity discovery looked like as you were uh, coming into your own. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's 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 like a, a more than an hour, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think about like you know just the journey itself and um you know i grew up long island new york um as we were talking earlier we've got long island crew up in here um, i grew up on the south shore of long island and um i was a lesbian i came out as a lesbian to myself when i was about 13. i knew i liked girls when i was in third grade i had a big crush on my music teacher i didn't know what that meant though um and then when i was 13 i discovered like oh wow like yeah i'm actually um i like girls and so i came out as a lesbian publicly when i was 16 and i felt really good in lesbian scene i was uh self-identified butch lesbian i was expressing my masculinity in all these ways that was really accepted within the lesbian community and as i got older and got out of high school and started uh um community college i kind of just started exploring more of who i was as a person and i started to really start to get more into the masculine world and really start to express myself the way that i've always really wanted to and i was dating somebody who asked me if i ever wanted to be a boy and i was just like what what are you talking about like first i didn't know it was possible second i just it was just I think because I didn't know it was possible, it was just so far from a reality. It was kind of like someone being like, hey, like you want to go to the moon? And I'm just like, what? That's Is that a real question? Are you, you know? Um, 
And that's, you know, within like two or three weeks from that moment, I met my first ever in real life uh, trans person. And it absolutely drastically changed my life. Um, I mean, it just opened up a world of possibilities for me. And I always say that like being trans saved my life because not being able to have language for how I felt and who I was and be able to represent myself in the way that I knew that I was like inside um, really, really allowed me to actually become a whole person. No, I love how you phrase that, you know, discovering who I was saved my life, you know, being trans saved my life. I feel much the same way in my own experience here, you know, um, being able to finally free myself of so much pain and anxiety and um, dysphoria. Gosh, you know, I think back to right before I came out and the place I was in in my life versus the place I'm in today. Um, and this is life saving. It's life saving to have the language. It's life saving to meet other people who've been through this process and have the opportunity to become who we we've always been. Um, I think that's important. Right. It's an important conversation to have. It's important to remind people of, especially allies and, and those who are looking to learn more, that this this isn't a choice. It's it's life saving. Right. Yeah. No, I love that. Um, I have like a whenever people ask me the choice question, right? Like, is it a choice? Yeah. Is it a choice? Like, I always like to um, kind of spin it on its head in a way. Um, cause so many people will say like, oh, well, like you're choosing this, you're choosing to make your life hard or whatever they think that this trans experience is that someone would choose it. Um, and I always say like, you know what, in a lot of ways, you're right. Like one day I woke up and chose to live my authentic self. And so I did choose this. I chose to be who I truly am. That's what I chose to be. And that happens to be a transgender guy, you know? Yeah. Can not put it better myself? But let's talk a little bit about those early days and your experiences. And that's something I'm really curious of here. Um, so you had the opportunity to, to meet a trans individual, but how did you deal with doubt and fear at the start of your transition? And did you, know, did you feel any of that? Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> it's a, a lot of doubt and a lot of fear. Uh, I think you know, doubt just coming from feeling like just not knowing a lot of other trans people. So it's like, oh, am, am I just thinking that if I live this other life, my life will be so much better and I can forget what I've gone through in the past or, um, you know, just trusting yourself. It's a big deal to transition and to live in society as one gender and then to live in that same society as another. I mean, it's, it is a big deal. Thing, right. Um, and I think that for me, like, and then, I mean, the fear, oh my gosh, you mentioned fear, right? Like, <laughs> um, fear mm -hmm. is like, that's like, like I started all of my stuff on YouTube and my channel name was Alliance Fears because I was so <laughs> terrified of, of coming out. Like I was just terrified of what my life could or what I thought it would become. Um, and so, I mean, yeah, doubt, fear was very prevalent in my, in my existence. Um, and I think for me, you know, I was living, I was, you know, I, I started my, my journey starts when I was about like 12, when I was 12 and 13 is when I started realizing I liked girls. And when I was 12, I was the first time I ever self-harmed. And I continued self-harming all the way up till I was about 19 years old. Um, and there were large chunks of that time where it was, you know, very intense. Um, and I really was very depressed and very angry. And I really idolized um, people who were, you know, in books and movies who were able to, you know, commit suicide. And I really felt like that's where my life was going to be. I really had a commitment to myself that I wouldn't, you know, live, like I always say, like I, I wouldn't live past 27. That was my big thing. Um, I just didn't want to get old, so to speak. I didn't want to like have to live my life in this body as this person that I was. Um, and so I think like, you know, feeling having that as the last six years, seven years, eight years of my life before I transition, um, it was kind of like, a, 
uh, I got nothing to lose in the sense that if I don't start living my life right now, then I'm never going to have a life. I'll never actually be happy. I'll never find someone to fall in love with. I'll never have a family. Um, and so to me, you know, it was like, this is my shot. This is my chance to be who I am and, and live that, you know? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, in many ways, I can relate to many of those feelings that you, you experienced there. And I know that for me, what finally drove me to begin my transition was when, you know, my fears of ultimately, um, you know, having a, having an incident like that happen, um, seem more likely than, than not, you know, um, when the fears of, of me doing something drastic with my own life, uh, seem more probable than actually working through these feelings and emotions without, without taking that step. And I knew at that point that the fears of transitioning, the fears of actually coming out and being public about this were less scary than the idea of not being here to see my children grow up. Um, mm -hmm. and, and be here for, for so many, you know, so much of the rest of my life. And that was when I knew that I really needed to address this. If, if I wanted a future, if I wanted, um, to go forward in my life, I needed to address these feelings. And I do want to say, you know, this is obviously a really, um, tough topic to talk about. Um, but it's an important talking topic as well. Um, and if you are having any feelings like this, if you are watching the show, you are not alone and there is help out there for you. And as always, at the end of our show, we will have uh, information for uh, Trans Lifeline, which is an organization that does provide assistance for individuals who are in dark places. And uh, just want to throw that out there now. We'll make sure to get that up here at the end of the show as well. So I do want to go back and talk a little bit about your work with YouTube. Um, you're sort of in a unique situation with your YouTube experience in that you've been chronicling your journey there for over 10 years now. And in the age of YouTube, that's actually really impressive that you have all that history up there. Yeah, no, thanks. <laughs> I'm happy that like something came out of those hours and hours of editing videos and stuff, um, being able to like point to, like you said, like this, like, uh, uh, like encyclopedia of my your timeline might be a better word of just my entire transition um it seems like yeah i was just a baby look at that baby i felt like i wouldn't really have anything to say when i began this journey 10 years ago i had no idea where life was going to take me i was 21 years old with no language to describe the way i was feeling and no one to turn to I don't feel comfortable as a woman, but I don't feel 100% comfortable as a man. I, I feel like I'm still figuring out, you know, I know that I, I, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. My body so was so <laughs> what was led so you, <laughs> it is, it's, it's an incredible, and that, that tribute video you have up there, that, that's, uh, it's really cool to, to see those Thanks. clips put together. Um, but what led you to, start posting YouTube in the first place. I'm curious. Yeah, I mean, like we were talking before, just like feeling alone. I just felt so alone. I didn't have any friends who knew what it was to be trans. I had that one person that I just happened to meet. Um, and then when I would go to the trans groups, like it was it was all trans women, which was fine. But as a young trans man who wasn't on T, who wasn't even like, comfortable using my preferred pronoun and you know all those things i just i i was looking for other men that could you know help me and i wanted to have friends like i don't like i don't know how else to say it right like i started it because i was lonely i didn't have any community and i just wanted someone to talk to and so i talked to my camera and then i talked to like the couple of you know, dozen of people back in 2010 who would watch the video and comment. And I built a community that way. And it just kind of organically was something that I kept up. It was just like, oh, you know, this person would make a video and then I'd make a response video or this person would post a 
some type of, you know, challenge. And then I would, and then, um, and then I was like, Hey, like I should start documenting my own journey because I watched all these other guys. There was maybe five or six other guys online at that time. And I felt just so seen just by watching them sit in front of a camera and talk about dysphoria, which wasn't even a word that was being like really used and just talk about like how out of their body they felt and what they were doing to help themselves and, you know, just relating to these other guys. Um, and I just want to be a part of the conversation. That's all I wanted. Uh, and it's just kind of crazy <laughs> to, to know what, what transpired from that, you know, just, you never know just by walking into the door, like what's going to be on the other side. Um, so that it's definitely something I always try to remember anytime I'm entering a new space. It's just like, you never know what's going to come of this. Um, and it might not be come to fruition until like six years from now, you know? Yeah. I mean, whenever you put yourself out there on social media, you, you're never quite sure what you're going to experience. Uh, when people actually find your material, right? What's right. the most difficult thing about putting yourself out there? And what's the most rewarding thing? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because when I first started putting myself out there, it wasn't called social media. Like there was no viral videos, nobody was making money off of YouTube. So it was just so different then, right? Um, so I think like the hardest part is for me, right, it's all different, right? Like, what are our core wounds? What are the things that make us, you know, hurt inside, trigger us? So for me, it's, it's a, the, I think the hardest part is just trying to expect myself to be perfect, expect myself to always have the right thing to say and always be able to support the person who's on the other end trying to get support from me to, you know, um, always have the right thing to say or the right post to make or, um, you know, if, if someone leaves a comment and they're upset about what I said, like sometimes it'll weigh on me and I'll just be like, oh, like I, I wish that they, I, I didn't mean it that way. And, and, you know, and then they just go off and it's just like, no. So, so trying to be perfect and like pleasing other people is definitely something that is the hardest part because trying to be perfect and pleasing other per people is just so inauthentic and it's not, it doesn't make me, I never feel good <laughs> when I leave that conversation. Right. Um, and then the most rewarding thing is just see like, because I've been doing online like activism for so long, it's like, I literally have seen like these little trans boys who like started transitioning like five years ago. And now they're like, they've got a girlfriend or maybe they're, they're married to their husband or maybe they started a family or they started a business or like, um, so it's, it's cool. Cause I get to see these people grow up. I mean, there's, um, I, I won't say his name, but there's this one, I mean, he's a, a young man now, but I knew him, I met him when he was 14 and he's 20 and he's like going, he's, you know, like last year he was like, I'm going to college. I can't believe it. Like, thank you so much. And it was just, and I just had this beautiful conversation and it was just like, you know, like, I'm just so proud of all of the people who just see something that inspires them and, and believes in themselves enough that they can do it too. I mean, that's just, it's really it's super rewarding. Absolutely. It's such an amazing feeling to watch somebody blossom into themselves, right? right. To actually just be confident and happy in who they are. I mean, seeing someone be happy in life and, you know, working with them through that process, gosh, is there a better feeling anywhere in seeing someone be happy in, in who they are? Right. It's I incredible. Mean, I don't, yeah, it's, there's not, it's, it's really awesome. It's, it's really beautiful. Yeah. So your online presence has grown slightly since you started out on YouTube 10 years ago. Um, I did want to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit how your advocacy has grown since starting out? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I think I just went from like being a dude on YouTube to try to make friends. Um, and then I wanted to get my top surgery. And that's kind of where I think it actually all st stemmed from. I was very active on my YouTube channel, just again, trying to make friends and connection. And I wanted top surgery really bad. Um, and I, I honestly, like, I, I think what really 
started the activism work is through my clothing company, which then transferred over into my nonprofit. And I started making shirts that were trans affirming and trans empowering and like proud to be a trans person instead of like all the stories I heard of people just like transitioning and then going south and transitioning and going south, which was fine, but it was almost like a requirement at the time. It was almost like you can't live an out proud trans life. And that's what I wanted to do because I, I had come from living an out proud lesbian life and I didn't feel any need to go back into any closets. Um, and so I started the clothing company and I think just with the messaging that was on the clothes was its own form of like activism in a way or um, advocacy, so to speak, right? Just like providing these statements and these affirmations and these positive things for the trans community and then giving the money, the proceeds that I made from that, giving it back out into the community. And also then I started doing binders. I, I, start, I had a friend give me about like six binders that were used and he was like, you could probably find quicker homes for these. And so then I was just like, hey, buy a t-shirt, help me with my surgery. I'll give you a free binder, which at the time were like $60, um, which thank God for companies like GC2B and like the other people out there making affordable, good quality binders. Um, but I think that's kind of where it all kind of started to actually be a sense of resource for the trans community and not just, you know, a guy on YouTube that you can go check out his, you know, beard timeline or something you know right yeah paying you know pay, giving back right 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 so what challenges did you face early on in getting a nonprofit off the ground um the challenges where i didn't know what the hell i was doing <laughs> <laughs> i had never started a nonprofit before i um i'd worked for nonprofits before right um but I had worked for like LGBT centers and stuff, but I never actually started a nonprofit. And so lots and lots of love and shout outs to uh, my, the co-founder of Point of Pride, who is Jeff. Um, and he, him and I, you know, we just did our best. We took the knowledge we had. We did a lot of research. We um, were taking some, as I was saying, like the profit from Point 5 CC, we like, paid for a lawyer. We got, um, you know, all of the things filled out. We've, you know, it, it is a process. And um, I think the biggest hurdle though was not necessarily starting the nonprofit, but creating a board of people that were emotionally available enough to provide support for others um, and be able to do that like for free because the entire board and the entire nonprofit is volunteer. And so that was kind of the hardest part, I would say, honestly, is finding people who have the resource, the time, and willingness to volunteer their time. Um, everybody who has served on the board for whatever period of time it has, has always given their 100%. And I'm proud to stand by anyone who's been on our board. Um, and it definitely was difficult in the beginning, because I think as trans people, we want to help others. And sometimes we don't realize when maybe we're the person that we should be focusing on helping first so that we can then show up for our other, um, you know, siblings in the community. No, that's a great observation there, right? We have to be able to take care of ourselves so that we can help other people. Um, but it is, uh, running a nonprofit's a huge commitment. And uh, so you, you've got a board, you're starting to get things running. Where was the first point in that process where it felt like, oh yeah, this is actually working? Uh, I would say we had, um, I think it was, you know, we gave away, I think it was two years ago. So we've been open for five years. We, I've had the nonprofit for five years. It's actually our five year anniversary this year. We were going to have a big party at, Philly. So pretty disappointed that it didn't happen, but we'll have like mm -hmm. a sixth birthday. It, it'll be a little weird, but it'll still work. Um, and I think it was about two years ago, we gave away like $36,000. And I was just like, okay, like, I guess, I guess I have a nonprofit because, you know, um, and we hit 5,000 binders in 
57 different countries or something like that. Um, we kind of hit all of these benchmarks of things that I just never thought I could do. I mean, we're just shy of $200,000 um, for surgeries alone, like having given back in the last five years. So it's just, it's really um, wild. It's, it's still kind of wild to think that all of that has occurred. But I definitely think like, you know, we got 1500 applications for the surgery fund. And that's when I was like, well, we're going to need some help. Like, <laughs> it's going to take a long time. <laughs> I mean, those are some really incredible accomplishments that you've been able to do in, in five years. I know that there are other people out there who are watching this who may be interested in starting a nonprofit to support the trans yeah. community. What advice would you give them when they're trying to reach out for funding and outreach early on in that organization's life? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, make connections with other nonprofits. I think that a lot of times when you're in a community that's malnourished, we tend to like, hoard everything in when the trans community, our nonprofits are, are helping the trans community, but most times they're very different, right? So like point of pride, we love trans lifeline. Like they're such a resource for us even because people who come to us, we're able to then send them to trans lifeline and know that like, we don't have to now start a whole new division that's, you know, going to take on calls and, and hire all these people on. We can support Trans Lifeline, help raise funds for them um, and do things like that. So I think like recognizing when where what other communities you can help out with. Even the Jim Collins Foundation is another one that we have both shared resource. They, they also give away surgeries. Right. Um, so it's kind of like figuring out where you can link up with other people because they'll have the resource. They might have somebody that is, you know, a good donor that could, you know, um, or they might have a grant that they couldn't apply for, but your, you and your nonprofit might be perfect for it. So they might be like, Hey, go apply to the love loud fest. Cause we got, you know, 10 grand last year. And I really think you qualify things like that. So first, just like starting with who, you know, in your community and don't be afraid to just send an email. The worst case, you don't get one back and that's it, right? Um, but I think overall, uh, I think finding grants has been one of our bigger ways because, you know, I, there's a lot of people out there that are not trans that are willing and rightfully so giving their money to the trans community because they want to help us. And I don't think that it's in, I don't think it's necessary for me to ask every trans person to donate because that's who we're trying to help. Let the people who should be providing us with the services to begin with, to get these surgeries and to have access to these binders and these gaffes and to have our electrolysis and to have our HRT, like let them pay the bill. That's really how I see it. So we are always going for grants. We're going for, um, and there's websites out there to have just lists of LGBT grants. You can find one just for trans. Maybe maybe um, there's something specific about your niche in your nonprofit that you can find. Finding really, really specific grants is another really great uh, way of doing that. Um, and then of course, there's always like on the ground, just hard work of, of just having like Facebook um, fundraisers and birthday fundraisers and that stuff definitely works. I'm not trying to say that doesn't work. Um, but again, I'm really, I'm really about trying to like get money from over there and bring it over here. Like that's, that's right. really where, what I'm about. <laughs> no. And that's, I think that's the right, right way to approach it. If the funds are out there, if the grants are available, bring them in. Right. And a lot right. of those go, you know, unclaimed or underutilized. So you know, the organizations out there that, that need that money, it's just a matter of finding them, right? You have to actually do the right. research and fill out the forms and do the applications, but it pays out. Absolutely. I mean, if you can take an hour and then get five grand, I mean, that's pretty good. I, mean, <laughs> I think that's pretty good. Um, you know, uh, and, and the other thing too is like, there are really big nonprofits out there and they don't all help the trans community and they tend to hoard a lot of the fundraising dollars because they have big names, because they have celebrities, because they can have these big gal galas, galas. Small nonprofit, you really got to put your, you know, your, uh, what is it? There's a 
saying something in the fire. You got to put your stick in the fire. You got to throw your towel in the ring, keep whatever your, that's. Keep there. your embers in the fire. Embers in the fire. I, I don't know. Some saying like that. You got you to put yourself out there, um, you know, in that way. So. No, all good advice. And what would you say for other people who are interested in starting a nonprofit of their own? I mean, I feel like, you know, if you have the bandwidth and capacity, um, do it. I think you have to really think about what it takes to run a nonprofit and how long you want to run the nonprofit. Is there just like a single goal you're trying to get to? Is it something that you're, you can see yourself doing in 10, 20 years from now? Um, and if it is, then start it. And if it's not, I think we have to be really honest with ourselves and know when it's time to just maybe volunteer for another nonprofit because you can save the, the whole world and not actually have to have like the responsibility of the nonprofit on your hands, right? And like have to worry about the taxes and filing your for the IRS in time and filling out this and that. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, nuisances that go in bylaws and, you know, you have to have, especially if you're gonna have board members, you have to make sure that they're getting background checks because they're going to have exposure to people's personal information. So there's a lot of things that go into it. So um, I would definitely just do your research, decide if it's for you. And if it is, go for it. And if it's not, then definitely don't waste, like, don't let that energy go wasted. Like, call me, we can volunteer for us. Like we can hook you up with other ones you can volunteer for too. Um, there's definitely places that your services are needed and really, really appreciated. Absolutely. And you're, you're, you're dead on there because it is a lot of work to run a nonprofit. Um, even just volunteering, even being on a board is, is a lot of work that you have to sit down and, and get done. Um, so sometimes it is better to be on the board as opposed to running at one outright. Um, I did want to share your Instagram page again there. So we've got point of pride org on Instagram and of course your website point of there. So for anyone who's watching, who's interested in the services that you provide, definitely go check them out. You, you do amazing work between your surgery, work, uh, funds, your binder funds, electrolysis it's you're, you're providing an amazing service to people who, who truly need it in the trans community thanks yeah i mean i couldn't do it without the board <laughs> always first and foremost it is not all me by any means um it is a, a really amazing board i mean we i mean we easily all work part-time um every week i mean all of us it's it's really it's amazing when you have committed people because you can really do a lot of big things. And, you know, everyone thinks about getting to the top of the mountain. And I think they have this image of like them at the top of the mountain. And it's like, start thinking about you and all the people that are going to come with you because that's how you're going to get actually, like, that's how you're going to get to the top, right? Or you're going to help the most people is like, you're not going to do it alone. So, so get that image out and start bringing people in, building that community, and, and so you can all rise up to the top. I love that. You know, we're stronger together, right? Yeah, absolutely. So somehow between your work with your nonprofit, your work online as a public speaker, an educator, a cover model, you still found time to find love and recently became a father. So I'm wondering from one parent to another, how has parenthood treated you so far? <laughs> it's good. Uh, I've already had to like, you know, we were talking early, it's bath time right now. So I've had to like kind of ignore some of the, <laughs> the noises that come with that. But um, it's been awesome. I mean, it's it's so interesting. Um, I, I'm curious, actually, Samantha, I've, I've had this come up more recently. Um, I find that the ability for me to complain in any way about being a father, just like how tiring it is or whatever, all the million things that come with having children. Um, it's almost like I'm not allowed to because I'm trans and like, you should just be lucky that you have a kid. So like, you shouldn't oh, wow. be complaining about them or cause like, if I'm complaining about them, then it's like, well, why did you even have one? As opposed to like, Cause it's like, well, you had to consciously take this effort to have this child. And if you, d 
if you're not having a good time, why did you have it? Like, as opposed to if it was like, you know what I mean? Like if I wasn't trans and yeah. we just had a baby, nobody asks like, well, why'd you have the kid if you don't like, you know what I mean? Like, have you experienced that at all? I mean, I know your situation is a little different, but I'm just yeah. curious. Well, it's interesting. I think that when people see trans parents or parents who are trans, trans parents, um, you know, they, they, they put a different lens on us, right? Like there's some sort of special hoops we should jump through or that we should feel honored just to have the, the right to be parents. Um, and some of that is, is leftovers from, you know, earlier times and earlier thoughts on what it means to be a parent. I, I don't think we should be scrutinized to that level. You know, I, I think that being a parent is hard. Being yeah. the parent of a young child is harder. Um, and yeah, you are going to be tired. And if anything, one of the greatest unifying things about, you know, being trans is that it's not a defining feature of who we are as a person. Yeah. It's just something that happens to be happening or happens to be a part of our identity, but it doesn't make us any less tired when our kids wake up at four <laughs> o'clock in the morning. It doesn't make us any less grumpy when they get a marker and they color on the walls or it doesn't, right. make, us, doesn't make it any easier um, on our hearts when they fall and scrape their, their knees, right? Um, we're, we're just parents doing our best every day. And I think that's how you have to look at it. I mean, it is an honor to be a parent, um, but I, I think that the, the trans part doesn't really fit into that equation um, as a as an important part. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, no, I I, yeah. I appreciate you saying it because I think sometimes you just have to hear, yeah. you know, you just have to hear it from someone else. Like, wait, I'm not like crazy for thinking this is a weird that this, <laughs> this is any type of backlash I'm getting is like, you know, uh, complaining that I'm tired, you know, and it's like, well, you should be really like, you should just be happy all the time, you know? Um, yeah. Interesting. No, I appreciate that. Well, this Thank this you. show is named trans IRL, right? We keep it real here and right. real life is hard sometimes and being a parent right. is hard. So right. um, I think it's important to talk about, I think it's important to talk about, you know, that you're still facing the same issues that so many other parents face. And I think as a parent who is transgender, um, it does put us in a unique situation because, you know, our kids will grow up with that knowledge and hopefully, you know, we can impart a, a more understanding, um, just more understanding to our kids, you know, help them see right. that just because people are different or our backgrounds or histories aren't the same as other people, it's no less valid or anything like that. So I think it puts us in a unique situation to, to raise more open, welcoming and understanding children. Yeah, no, I agree. I totally agree with that. Um, yeah. But it has been amazing. Like there, Antler had like, that. my son's name is Antler and he had on his like little swimmy thing. It's like the chest and the thing and he has like a rainbow on it. And he had his little hat on and he came in this morning from the pool and I was like working and he was like, dad, dad. And he like looks in, you know? And I was just like, oh my God, my heart is melting, boy. What are you doing? I'm trying to work. Like, you're so cute, you know? Um, so there, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's such an array of emotion. Um, and it's taught me a lot about myself. That's for sure. <laughs> I think that after I came out, it really allowed me to be the parent I wanted to be. You know, I think I struggled with some of the societal expectations of that, of the role I was in before. And of, of course, I also struggled with the burden of depression and dysphoria and, and other things that just kept me from being as available for my kids as I, as I wanted to be. Mm. And being free of that pain and being free of, of some of those expectations allows me to be much closer to my kids and to have a better relationship with them. And for that, I am truly thankful. I love that. I couldn't agree more. I think it's, it's, it's really beautiful. If I, if I, I'm, you know, I, I had a whole, uh, breaking the boundaries to fatherhood series that I have, um, just wrapped up the first season and the second season will start in the fall. Cause I just, so many trans people don't think that they can have families and it's just, I just want to break that narrative. I just, I just want like everyone who's watching to know, like, if you want to have a family, like that's totally something you can do in your life. Being trans doesn't, it doesn't 
really shift that at all. Um, you know, there's different ways in which we can obtain our families, um, but it, it it's all comes down to the same thing. Um, so yeah, I, I love that. It's been beautiful. And it's been beautiful to see trans individuals sharing more about their families. I've seen so mm -hmm. much more visibility. Um, you know, Freddie with his movie Seahorse. Um, since then, I've seen so many other people who have come forward and shared their stories of having a family, um, even, you know, well, well, having a family, you, you know, while being trans, I guess. I don't know how else to phrase right. it. Um, <laughs> but it's not, it's important. It's important to have that visibility. And it's exciting to see more people are feeling comfortable sharing those stories so that people do feel comfortable knowing that, you know, that's still an opportunity for them if they transition. Absolutely. It's really cool stuff. Yeah. All right. So we know 2020 has been sort of a strange year with COVID and everything else. What are your hopes and dreams and goals looking forward into the next year here, assuming we're ever allowed out of our houses and <laughs> right. go work with people again? I was going to say, like, well, first goal is to get out of the house, right? Like, <laughs> right. that's the first goal. Um, well, I mean, honestly, so I moved to Austin from Oregon right before all of this happened. And I moved here to Texas because a lot of reasons, but one of the things I was the most excited about was building a community here because I, I have heard that the community, the trans community in the Austin area, it's here, but it's not really united and no real reason. It just, there hasn't been a force to unite. And in Texas, there's a lot of discrimination. There's like, there's no protections for trans people. Mm. So it felt like I, I felt a need to move here in the sense to help build a community and to help fight for the rights of the trans people here. Because I was in Oregon where it, it's awesome in Oregon. Like there's just, there's tons of rights. we got so much support, coverage, Medicare, all this stuff. Um, and then even in New York, uh, it's not quite as great as Oregon, but there's other protections in New York, which is, you know, where I'm from, um, where we're from. <laughs> um, and so I, I, I'm looking forward to building a community. Like I, I, I don't know, like I just, I like people. I like to be around people. I like to see people getting along and sharing stories. And like, I'm just like that hippie dude, like near the bonfire, who's just like, come on over. Like, let's talk, grab a marshmallow. Like, you know, tell me your life story. Like, let's talk about stuff. Um, so I'm really, I'm, I'm just really looking forward to cultivating that everywhere I go, whether that's like traveling, um, doing speaking events or, you know, pride, stuff like that, or even just right here in the local Austin community. So I'm really just, I just want to connect with people, you know? That's it. And what a fantastic opportunity there in Austin. Yeah. All yeah. right. So that, that, that was the end of my question. So thank you so much for working through those. I did want to go ahead and get over to our viewer questions as well. So if you are watching yeah. live on YouTube or Facebook right now, and you have a question for Eden or myself, go ahead and put it in the chat. We'll try to get to as many as we can here before the, uh, the end of the show. So we're going to start with our questions that were submitted through Instagram earlier this week. And our first question here is, how long did it take you to figure out what your name would be? Mm, the name. Names can be hard to pick, you know? Um, it's like, you gotta take it with you everywhere you go. Um, so know. my, right? <laughs> my name, some people like do names that are similar to their um, birth names, which is cool. Um, and I chose my name because I wanted to keep as many initials as I could, like as many letters as I could. So for some reason, when I was a kid, I signed things. I used to write a lot and, and do art and photography. So I'd sign things A E D. So I made sure I kept that initial. I wanted to make sure that I could, I could have that same initial. So my initials are stay, still A E D. Um, and I, Honestly, like I chose my name because I picked the coolest guy that I thought, like I picked the guy that I thought was the coolest and, and was like, I want to be him. So I'm going <laughs> to take his name in hopes that maybe I'll be like him. Um, it was a Nickelodeon show um, like for like their noggin or like their like, uh, like the Degrassi where all of that was on. Yeah. Um, it was, 
man, the name of it was like, it was like these two lesbians and, but the one was bisexual and there was this guy Aiden on there and he had a leather jacket and he had a cool motorcycle and he was like the like, you know, would like get in trouble, but like still have a really soft side and everyone really liked him, you know? Um, and so that's, that's literally where I got my name. Um, the spelling, however, is unique. Um, and that was me just Googling, like, what does Aiden mean? What does the name mean? Um, and I found actually a Celtic spelling of the name Aiden, which is A-Y-D-I-A-N. And that way is the gender neutral spelling. So it kind of worked out really perfect, actually. <laughs> no, that's, that's a great story. I love, I love people's name stories. And it's something really unique about being transgender, right? Is that we get to name ourselves, which is not something right. that a lot of people get to do. And it's such a personal story. Uh, my story is different, of course, but um, you know, we mentioned that, that I am a parent. I have four sons um, mm. and that's a lot of children, period. But uh, <laughs> when you're trying to think of names, when you're trying to think of names for kids before you, you know um, if they're going to be a boy or a girl, you, you make lists, you make lists of names and maybe I'll pick this name, maybe I'll pick this name. So over the course of having four boys, we had a like entire encyclopedia of girls' names that we never got to use because, you know, every everyone was a boy. Um, so from that list, uh, Samantha was one of the names on that list and I loved it. I always thought it was a beautiful name. Um, it was a name that fit well um, with my age and, and, and things like that, I thought, wow, what a, what a, what a great name. And, um, early, early on, um, see w one of the big things for me was I didn't want to pick a name before I came out because I was afraid if I did, it was going to be too much to, to have to hide it. So I didn't pick one until after I came out. Um, but I picked that name and like the same day, like I decided, yeah, I'm going to go with Samantha. Um, my, my spouse at the time wrote me. And she said, oh, I just think the name Samantha fits you so well. And I was like, okay, that's it. <laughs> that's it. So that's, that's my name story there. I love it. That's great. See, the wife always wins there, you know? <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's look at our next question here. Uh, what can we do to stop violence against trans women? Mm. Obviously a very important question with what we've seen out in the world. Um, I mean, just mm -hmm. here in the last week or so, we had three trans women who were attacked in Los Angeles. Right. Um, it's something that we continue to face. And the, the vast majority of uh, murders of trans individuals are, are trans women, especially trans women of color. Right, yeah. Um, first and foremost, talk about it. Talk about it, share it. Anytime there's opportunities to talk about it is to share it and all that things like, I mean, even before we were like, oh, you know, um, coming out as trans saved my life. And that's probably a lot of that is layered in like our whiteness because, you know, being white, it's just easier in America. And so coming out, there's just one less layer that we have to get through. Um, and so I think just talking about it is first and foremost. And then, so, you know, I've seen, um, which has been great, a lot of initiatives for nonprofits, including Point of Pride, um, is donating specific funds to black trans women. So we have an electrolysis program um, that is quarterly throughout the year. And we offer that um, to, that's a lot for trans women. I mean, it's mostly all trans women. I think we might've had, um, one non-binary person who's been awarded that. Um, and we try to our best to make sure that our candidates are representative of minorities and intersectionalities. And so a large percentage of those awardees have been black trans women, um, rightfully so. We have a COVID relief fund where we've uh, took the initiative to have 75% of those funds go back to black trans people. And then um, also we have an HRT program that's starting where our first round, I believe, um, I believe all, I believe all of the recipients will be um, black trans people, including black trans women. So I think just showing up, doing your best, getting educated, um, 
sharing information, following other black trans women um, on Instagram and all of the social media outlets so that you can really know what it's, you'll never know what it's like, but you can get a narrative that you have never heard before and, and trust that it's true and trust these black trans women that the stories they're telling are real, that the things their needs are real and that, um, you know, trusting them. I think that's really important. Just, just trusting that the stories that they're telling are things that need to be seen and heard in the trans community. I mean, I, I don't know what it's like to be intersectional and I do my best to educate myself and um, share that education without trying to center myself also. So yeah, I mean, I appreciate whoever brought this question up. It's just, as a, that's such a great way, right? Like if it hasn't been talked oh, yeah. about, ask a question, <laughs> you know, um, get the it. conversation yep. started. Right, right. Yeah, it's such an important conversation. I think you really covered a lot of ways that we can be better about it. Um, I especially like how you brought up following other uh, trans people of color on Instagram, for example. The algorithms will work against a lot of people. Um, they'll try to put you into a certain category of people or um, what it thinks that you want to follow. And sometimes you really have to go out there and try to find people to, to help work against that a little bit. So it's important we educate ourselves as well, even within the trans community, uh, to be better advocates for those who um, are, are minorities within our, <laughs> our minority group, right? Yeah, no, that's a great point. Really quick, you know, a trick to kind of trick the algorithm, so to speak, is whenever I follow someone new that's an educated source that like I want to learn from them because they are voluntarily giving out information, um, I always make sure I just like, I just like a bunch of their stuff. Just go in there and like, like the last like 20 posts because like something in the algorithm will be like, oh, you like their stuff. So we're going to show you more of their stuff. I don't know if you've noticed that like yeah. once you stop liking people's stuff, it just goes away and you don't even know, it does. you know, I follow like 3000 people. I probably see the same hundred people all the time. You know, um, it's, it's a little annoying, honestly. It's frustrating. <laughs> yeah. It is it's very, very frustrating. frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We'll go on to our next question here since we just have a few minutes left. Does point of pride help people outside of the U S Great question. Um, yes. So right now um, we have two of our two programs that work outside the U.S. So our gaff or tucking garment program that uh, can be served outside the U.S. as well as our binder program can be served outside the U.S. We can use our surgery fund for people outside of the U.S.A. But uh, due to just like the restrictions of being a U.S.A. nonprofit, you have to have the surgery in the United States in order for us mm -hmm. to actually give you the funds. So that's kind of like the messiness right in that. Um, but absolutely, I mean, gaffs and tucking garments and binders, please uh, check out pointofpride.org, sign up. We have bare minimum loopholes. All we do is we really trust the person who's applying that if you have the funds to buy these things, these garments, you will purchase them because when you take from a community that you know really needs it uh they don't get it and you get to keep like your 30 dollars but that garment could have like changed their life you know so we really go on good faith all right next question here what inspires you to keep sharing your story so far into your transition these are great questions. Um, I think I don't see a lot of guys who are on T for a long time. So that's one of the things. Um, and just also like we were talking earlier, just like being a trans dad, uh, I feel like I get so many people who are like, oh, like I seen you and I seen this person and I really feel like I could be a dad. And that is just really awesome, you know? Um, so I think just keeping the community going, I think it's just so important that the LGBT community is based on our elders. And for trans people, a lot of our elders were forced to be stealth. And we have seen some of them come 
back out. Like people who like I've met some trans guys who've been on T for like 35 years. And I'm like, that's wild. Like, where were you 10 years ago when I was looking for you, you know? Um, but they were all stealth and stuff. So um, I think that like, that that's kind of my thing is like, I, you know, I want to be able to provide for the community. And to say that social media isn't the number one, like, asset that almost every person has access to. Um, I mean, I feel like that right there, right? Like, th that's, mm -hmm. that's why I do what I do just continue to um, be that voice for somebody who needs it at that specific time. No, I think it's absolutely important that you know, people do share their stories if they're willing to, if they have the capacity to share, to keep sharing and to stay visible. I mean, it takes work, right? It's not, it's not easy to be visible and to stay visible and to continue to put out content. It, it takes a lot of effort. And I definitely commend you for what you've been able to accomplish so far. Um, Thank you. And I think it's a, a valuable resource, an absolute, an absolute resource to the entire community. Thanks. All right, That's we've really got sweet. five minutes left. We've got two questions we're gonna try to get to here. Um, okay. And of course, this is the question we probably should have thrown up earlier when we had more time. Do you have any tips for someone looking to start working out before starting T? Yeah, you know, the quick answer to this is going to be, you should check out my YouTube channel. Um, it, you can just type in my name, Aiden Dowling, on YouTube.com in the search bar. And then when you go to my page, there's that little search button and just put in working out all the workout videos are going to be there. And I think I have at least two very specific for um, people who are not on hormones or maybe don't want to be on hormones, but are looking to uh, start working out or to feel more empowered in their body. I would, that, that would be like the quickest way to get a bunch of information all at once. Awesome. All right. And our last question here, what do you feel was the biggest moment a positive change or evolutionary adaptation to social media for advocacy and being visible? That's an SAT like question. A, I was going to say, it's like an academic question. Um, what do you feel? I feel like I have to reread them. What do you feel was the biggest moment of positive change or evolutionary adaptation to social media for ad The biggest moment of positive change, you know, um, I feel like there's been a there, there. I feel like on social media there was this moment in time, and I don't know when it happened, but there was this moment in time when we went from social media being entertainment solely and just like looking at pictures of other people and sharing pictures of friends and family and people you knew to starting to engage with people you don't know and starting to hear stories from people you don't know, and then that is when the shift came to becoming an educational resource for the for any community and all people because we can go on social media and find you know the most niche community out there and we can find people from it and hear their stories and see what they're talking about and get that education so i feel like that i i, I don't know when that happened but if you go on social media now i mean i i've been saying it's like in the, the last year i've been saying this it's like feels like a set source of news like a lot of the things I hear are because of Twitter or because of Instagram or because I saw someone share an article in their story and I'm like what's that I gotta know about that um, so I feel like at some point that kind of like shifted there was this moment um, where people started getting their their actual education and and resource from social media um, but I don't know if I could pinpoint I mean have you noticed that no, you're, you're definitely out of something there. It has changed and has evolved quite a bit. I mean, obviously people still are there for the photos, but it does seem like there is more, or there are more conversations happening that are educational, right? And there are more people mm -hmm. who are focusing on more of the actual information that is, is necessary to inform yourself. And that I think is a really cool part of the evolution of social media. And I did want to give you a chance to share your pages as well here really quick as we are wrapping things up. So um, first we've got your Instagram page here. Awesome, yeah, follow me. Just look me up, look my name up. Everyone thinks that it's like Allion, I don't know. It's Alliance Fear. <laughs> Check it out on Instagram. <laughs> and that's my uh, and we've also got website. 
AidenDowling.com. Yep. Um, if you wanted to see the rest of that tenure on T video, you can go to AidenDowling.com or you can follow me on YouTube. It's also available right there. Um, shout out to Arlen Kent who helped me make that video as awesome as it came out. It really is fantastic. It's worth the watch. So I definitely implore people to go out there Thanks. and check it out. So we are, we're at the end. That was it. We got all the questions in. Thank you so much, Aiden. Um, real quick, before we wrap things up, I did want to remind people that if you aren't following, following us on YouTube, please do follow us over here at Trans IRL. Um, you will get notifications when we go live, which is always very helpful. And uh, we're also on Facebook at Trans IRL Show. You can actually catch our show live on either Facebook or YouTube. And on Instagram, we are Trans IRL. And you do have the opportunity to submit questions to our guests before show. And Instagram will also let you know who our next guest is going to be next month. We've got some good ones we're working on for you. So with that, let's bring everyone back on here. And Aiden, once again, thank you so much for a little bit of time tonight. I know it took you away from uh, the family a little bit, but we're so appreciative of your work and everything that you're doing to support the community. So thanks once again. Thank you. It was really awesome. I enjoyed our conversation and it was a pleasure. All right. And Stephen, thanks again for keeping things running in the control room there. And as I mentioned before, we've got some great guests we're working for, working on for you here over the next couple of weeks. So we'll get that information up as soon as we have it. From all of us here at Trans IRL, I want to wish everyone a good evening. Thanks, everyone. Bye.